Hey, I'm Chris Zepp from Make Everything, and today we're going to be making this steel gate using the forge. Check it out. All right, so this video is going to be a little bit different. When I was given this project, I really had no idea how I was going to do it. So when I am given a project like that on something that I'm not really familiar with, there's a, a process of figuring it out as I go along and experimenting with different things. And I thought it would be important to show that. So this video is going to be my process in terms of experimenting and figuring out how to get from a drawing on paper to a finished product. I hope you enjoy it. All right, so I got to build this gate and I have the design concept. The client gave me the design. He handed it to me on like a big piece of paper. It was full scale. Now I have the intent and I went ahead and I made a rendering for myself in Google SketchUp. Now the renderings, I always like to do a rendering anytime I'm going to fabricate a project because the worst feeling in the world is handing somebody over their project and having them kind of give you that look of this isn't what I expected. So the renderings are sort of my safety for that. I really recommend that anybody that's going to fabricate for anybody else always provide a drawing or a sketch or a rendering is great because it really gives them the idea. Google SketchUp is super easy to use, but we're not getting into that. We're going to get into making this. Now, I really don't know how to make this. Um, and that's one of the big questions I always get is how do you approach a project that you've never made before? So I figure for this video, it's going to be a little bit different and I'm going to explain the process as I go in terms of what I'm thinking and how I'm coming to the decisions that I come to in order to try and make this. So let's get started. All right, so I know that I want to use one by one tubing for the frame and I want to miter these corners. So that's, that's easy. So my thought process here is I'm going to build this frame, make sure it's nice and square. I'm going to grind those welds and then I'm going to use that frame to lay out these hearts. Now these don't have to be any specific size. They're kind of up for my interpretation. And I'm going to basically just try and bend these over a mandrel and get something that looks like this. So let's start with the tubing. All right, so I have my frame established and now I need to figure out a way that I'm gonna bend the tops of those heart pieces. Now I've got these two chunks of steel. This is a rotor from my truck. Um, and this thing, this thing measures about seven and a half inches in, in diameter, which I think is gonna be a little bit too small. And then this hockey puck that I got up uh, upstate New York, this is like nine and a quarter. I think this is gonna be more the size. So basically I'm gonna trace this frame with the soapstone and then freehand sketch using these shapes to establish what I can bend hot around the material that I have. Um, this method of bending hot around material, uh, my friend Matt taught me. Check him out on Instagram. He's a great fabricator. All right, so I laid out the two hearts around my mandrel that I'm going to use with the soapstone. Now the soapstone is great, but as you can see it, it rubs off really easily. So I'm going to solidify these marks with a Sharpie. And then this is basically going to be my new build to plans.
Almost. Almost. All right, two failed attempts, but it's okay. We're gonna figure this out. Everything's gonna be fine. Time to do some rethinking. All right, let's talk about the mistakes that I made here. First of all, the clamps, that was never gonna work. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. That was just stupid. Second of all, this puck has a big mark on it where when they plasma cut it, um, I guess where it started and stopped, and I didn't even think, and I put that right in the middle of that bend. So even if I had gotten good bends, they would have had a big blemish in them. So that was stupid. I already welded this thing to the table, so that was stupid. So now it's time to just beat this thing off the table um, and keep going, so. The other thing was I didn't even try any material in this before I started. I just was like, yeah, turn on the forge, it's fine. So that was stupid. So now I gotta, size this right and actually do this right. We're going back to the drawing board. All right, so in hindsight, what should I have done differently? Well, I should have definitely welded all this down. We learned that already. Um, this piece of metal is still kind of hot, but I'm gonna use it basically figure out how the hell to make this better. Now this piece of metal needs to be welded to the table really square. This piece of metal needs to be welded to the table at the right distance and I need to allow myself an area that this can be clamped so that as it runs around it, it has to go around the right way. Um, it has to basically be pulled around the mandrel and this has to be in the right orientation. So I think if I do this like this, I should be able to keep it pretty well aligned as I go. Damn, this thing is super hot. I also burned this material because I left it in the forge too long because I thought I should do two at a time. But I really, I, what the hell? I don't know what I'm doing. How would I decide that I should do two at a time? That was just stupid. So, all right, let's, let's get this thing, let's do this right. That's warm. Wow, that's hot. It's not warm, it's hot. That gives me enough room to slide that in there, clamp this, and get it around. I think that's gonna be good. What do you think? Think it's gonna be good? I oh, think it's gonna be, gonna be good. It's gonna be great. Let's turn it back on and try again. two fails, I think we're where we need to be. Now that basically fits perfectly on my little template, and uh, now just time to do three more. So this is the second one I just did. It's still super hot. Now the curve is nice and I like it, but 
I kind of wish that I had a little more heat down here and I could kind of swoop that in so that in the end I had more of like a, you know, this lobe shape. All right, so here's the next piece. Now they, they're all they're starting the same length, but what I got to do is I got to make sure I get a little bit of heat all the way down to there. So I'm just going to maybe like leave a little mark on there. Or, you know what, I'll just leave the Sharpie. And basically what I'm going to try and do is use my forge to just heat up this section and leave the front basically cool so that as I bend it, I get that little bit of swoop. I don't know, let's see what happens. All right, so here's where we stand. I got all four of the curls done, but I'm not loving this part right here. So as you can see, I've got a nice curve and then I have this straight. Now the, the shape that I want is more like organic on the edge. So uh, my forge obviously isn't big enough to put this all back in, but what I'm thinking is I should put it in the forge, turn off the back burner and have just the front burner heat this area and then what I can do is drop it back over the mandrel and kind of continue that swoop and try and get this on all four pieces to kind of bend back in to a point where, you know, they, they look a little more organic. So um, I could absolutely ruin all of these. Well, actually, I wouldn't ruin all of them. I'll probably just ruin the first one, but whatever. We're figuring it out as we go, right? Let's do it. I'm thinking if I get this piece in there like that, it's gonna heat up that area that I wanna bend and it's gonna leave the rest of this cool. So I think this should work. Let's find out. So, here's what we've got. We were able to get these a little more organic. They're still very hot, so I can't touch them. And they're much closer to the drawing that I was working off of. I'm really psyched that this jig setup worked out. And now, gotta cut these up and get them blended together so they look nice and continuous. So my thought process here is just to mark these out and then cut them rough with the bandsaw. And then once I have them rough cut, 
basically once I weld this stuff together, I'll be able to refine everything and grind it. But I'm gonna try and keep any welds out of that crease because I don't wanna try and clean that up. All right, so here's where we're at. Um, I got the two hearts welded up and tacked at least. Now the question is, do I want to stay faithful to this design and keep them in? Or do I want to spread them out and let them hit these points? Now originally this was supposed to be wrapped in a wood that was going to protrude over it, which is why I had that little spacer there. Uh, but now I'm thinking it might look better if it just filled it. And the other thing is like I could tack this up and then I could always move them in once I cut everything and fit it. So I think, uh, I think I'm gonna take some artistic liberty on this one and uh, make that decision because I think it'll be nice. I don't know. Only one way to find out. All right, I'm thinking I want to try and get like a little bit of curve out of this. I don't know if it's gonna work. But maybe I can just kind of force a little curve there. Oh, broke that weld. Oh, okay. That's not gonna work. Nice. All right, we did it. That's what I was looking for, baby. Look at that. It's all ground. It's all done. Oh, this is great. All right. So the gate itself is welded, ground, and I would call it like 99% done. Now I have the dimensions of the pergola that this is going. And while I could try and build into those dimensions in air, I always feel more comfortable building into a space. So what I'm going to do now is just make up a quick two by four frame that is exactly the width of that pergola and then clamp it to the table and basically work within that. Now I'm using a uh, weld on pin hinge for the two sides over here. And I think the way the weight is distributed with more of it towards sort of this side, um, I'm actually gonna be in good shape in terms of the balance. 
So let me wait, make up that uh, two by four frame. I don't really think you guys need to watch me do that. So two by four frame. Ah, oh, I'm back. All right, let's see. Well, I didn't make it too small. Now, I have a twisted frame, but that's my issue. I have 7 eighths. I got 7 eighths between the edge of this gate um, and the, basically the jam of the pergola. I've got these pin hinges. Now, if I put these in here, like that, push that tight, see what I got left. I would like to give myself a 1 8 plate against the uh, actual pergola. So I'm gonna weld these to a 1 8 plate. I think I can just weld this thing up. Uh, I don't think I need to do anything too crazy. I just need to make sure everything sits nice and flat. And I'm actually gonna do this in a way that these, uh, these can, this, this gate can be lifted off and removed. Um, sometimes when you use pin hinges, you put one upside down on the bottom and one the right way on the top so that the uh, gate can't be removed. But in this case, um, I'm gonna leave it so that the gate can be lifted off if they ever need to get it out of the way for any sort of yard service or anything. All right, let's do it. All right, so I'm gonna use these aluminum blocks as spacers to make sure that these wind up in the right spots. And I'm just gonna make sure I get a really good <coughs> clamp on that so that it uh, doesn't go anywhere when I weld it. What do you think? I think we're gonna be fine. How hot are these? <laughs> just keep touching them, just keep touching them, you dumbass. All right, cool. All right, gotta grind these welds and screw them onto the post. All right, so it works. Next thing to do here is just gonna be to finish weld these hinges on and uh, move on from there. Nice. <laughs> All right, so the gate is done uh, in terms of welding and grinding. The hinges are done. Uh, the offset is good. I'm happy with the way it all looks. Um, it functions well, and I don't think I have to worry about any sagging. I think 
any sort of flex that I'm seeing in my assembly is just because this two by four section isn't very rigid. Now I need to create some sort of um, a latch for it. And what I was thinking was to put some sort of a spring pin on this side, um, cause you can imagine there's gonna be two posts here and you're gonna be able to reach your hand in and I want something that's not gonna be seen from the front. So I have this spring pin um, that I can either weld onto this or screw onto it, or there's gonna be a teak cap put on this thing so it could even get screwed into the teak cap. But I'm gonna need to make some sort of a strike plate for it. So this is the spring pin that I'm talking about. And what would be nice about this is it's super low profile. It's zinc plated, so it should actually last. And uh, I can just basically put this on the gate on the back side, if you can imagine like that. And then if I create a strike plate with a long strike, this will actually recess as it goes into the closed position and then pop into the hole. So that should be a pretty, pretty quick and easy thing to fab up. So as you can see, the way this works is this spring, um, because the strike is so long, it gives this time to catch it and then lock in place. Now, I could weld this on, but I'm not going to. I'm going to uh, drill and tap two holes here once I've confirmed that this works during the test fit, because if this thing ever gets messed up or if it rusts and rots out, I'd rather be able to take it off with screws and replace it than have to deal with you know grinding off the welds and doing it that way. But I think this is a nice solution and this will be on the inside of the gate. So from the outside, since this is such a slim profile, you won't actually be able to see this hardware, which I think will be really nice. Okay. So it's been a couple days and I went and I test fit this gate at the client's house. Now the original plan for this project was to have the gate fabricated here and then have it powder coated. Now, after the client saw it, he really liked the raw look of the steel and decided that he wanted to go with a patina look. So I went ahead and made him a sample uh, using a gunsmithing patina called Plum Brown. It's made by Birchwood Casey. Now it gives you sort of like a controlled rusting sort of look and uh, depending on how many layers you put on it can give you like a really deep brown color. The original powder coat color was brown. So I've never used this stuff before. This is the Birchwood Casey Plum Brown. I did it on the sample and from reading the instructions, it needs to be applied hot. Now Birchwood Casey says to have the base material at 275 degrees, which is what they say hot enough that water will spit off of it. The goal here is going to be to try and heat this thing in such a way that I can apply the, the Plum Brown without totally driving myself crazy. So we're gonna learn together. Let's give it a shot. All right, so. Propane's hooked up. Let's see what happens if I, uh, I don't know. Let's see what happens. I haven't used this thing in a while. Oh, yeah. There we go. Oh, oh, yeah. I think this is going to work perfect. This is going to work perfect, I think. Oh, yeah. I'm getting a nice heat. Oh, this is actually, I think this is going to be great. But if I do this, I get extra heat. But I don't need the extra heat. I just want one level of heat. All right. Okay. So, putting... Is that going to burn the table? No. All right. So, I know the torch is going to work. A little warm. Let's get tooled up and get this done. All right. So, this thing is degreased. I've rinsed it. Now, I'm going to take this stuff, pour it. Nah, you know what? I was going to pour it into this cup. I'm not. I'm just going to leave it there. And I've got a heat gun, a temp gun here, so I can sort of get an idea of where this is at as I heat it up. And we're just going to give this a shot and see what happens. So I'm already, I'm already up in the 200 to 300 degree mark in this corner. Oh, wow.
is not easy to do. I don't think I got this part hot enough. Kind of like pink over here. Very difficult. <laughs> this is so difficult. I think I would be better suited with a rag. Way better. I have no idea. So what I'm finding is that this one by half is really hard to get hot. The 16th wall tubing gets hot really fast, but this one by half really takes a lot of heat to get it up to temperature. That's only at 95 degrees, barely over 100 degrees. So I really got to give this a lot of attention in terms of getting it hot. I think that's why I'm getting such a light color out of it. Okay, so it's working. Um, it's pretty uneven, still a little hot. Uh, but I actually think that the unevenness that I'm getting is gonna be good. You know, we're not going for perfect. The idea is that it's supposed to be sort of weathered um, and not look perfect. That's why we're not going with the powder coat. So it's got this sort of like copper wash in the areas where I didn't heat the metal up that much. And then this sort of rust and dark brown on the areas that I heat it up really well. So I'm gonna flip it around. This is technically like the back side. And I'm just gonna kind of keep going and spinning it around until I get a, you know, pretty much an even thing going with this. I'm gonna take it off the clamp and I'm gonna put it in a quick vise so it's easier for me to move it. And I'm just gonna keep heating it and applying this stuff until it looks good. I don't know, let's go. So the, the vapor fumes from this are starting to bug me. So I'm gonna put my full face respirator on just to make sure that, you know, I'm not kind of getting anything in my eyes or in my lungs as I sand this down. I probably should have put something on sooner, but here we are now. All right, so I've got a finish that I really like on this. And in my experience with these type of patinas, they usually oxidize a little bit more just from exposure to the air. So I'm gonna leave this as it is. Uh, I'm gonna leave the shop tonight and sort of see where this goes overnight and maybe come back and scotch bright some of these areas and do a little touch up before I start putting some coats of lacquer on this so that it can go outside. Okay, so it's been a couple days and the patina has actually settled in really, really nicely. It's got some highlighted areas, but for the most part, it's settled to a sort of rich brown and I'm really happy with it. I took some pictures of it. I sent them over to the client. He really likes it too. So now it's time to start the finishing process. Um, you'll notice that I didn't finish these small pieces of hardware yet. 
uh, because I wanted to get a confirmation on this. These little pieces will be easy. I'll just heat them up and apply the plum brown. And now for the finish on this, it's gonna live outside. And I've actually had good luck with polyurethane on exterior application. So I'm gonna put a couple of coats of satin wipe on poly on this over the course of the next couple of days before I go to install it. I'm gonna let it build up. It's pretty cold in here, so it's gonna take a while for that polyurethane to set up. And I'm just gonna give it its time and make sure that it's really thoroughly coated so it holds up in the elements. All right, so the polys had a good amount of time to dry. I turned the heat up in the shop last night so everything would cure up. It's raining today, but we're still gonna try and get the installation done. So I finished all the hinge parts and the strike plate last night. And since I already did that test install, the holes are already there. So the installation should go pretty quickly, basically just putting those screws in to the existing pergola that's there and hanging this thing up. So let's do it. All right, thank you so much for watching this. I really enjoyed this project. I had a lot of fun learning while I was doing, experimenting with this. I'm so happy with the results that I got in the end. And all in all, this inspired me to do more blacksmithing projects. And you know, any project like this inspires me to push myself and my skills, learn new things, try new things, not be afraid of the process that might come about when you know you take a drawing and try and make it a real thing. I hope you guys enjoyed this as well. Leave me questions down below. I would love to answer them. Um, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, at Make Everything Shop. I posted a lot about this while I was making it. I answered a lot of questions about the process um, throughout the process, sort of live through Instagram. So again, if you like this video, like it. Share it if you want to show it to someone else. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. I hope to see you on the next one. Thanks.